One of the leading figures in this American value hijacking, as I would call it, is a man named Edward Bernays. Bernays is most famous for his book called Propaganda. He was hired by all the major corporations many, many decades ago to help influence the public into buying things very simply that they did not need. To continue, I think there is also a problem in the analysis that I've seen in your works and that you presented tonight in the sense that I think we can tend to lose the forest for the trees. Why is this control necessary in the first place? And I would submit at least that I think it's because there's antagonistic interests involved. They didn't talk about milkmaids and dairy, uh, whatever it was, dairymaids and spinsters and laborers in the 17th century for no reason. It was because they were the working class. And what we see today in this country, I think, is quite frankly, let's speak bluntly, a ruling class which tries to control a working class population and that's what it's about is holding on to that power how much is enough Gordon? the richest one percent of this country owns half our country's wealth five trillion dollars one third of that comes from hard work two thirds comes from an inheritance interest on interest accumulating to widows and idiot sons and what i do stock and real estate speculation it's bullshit if that's the case, then it seems like to me the question that we face is how to organize to change that system, to challenge capitalism. And I think in that effort, you do a disservice to your listeners and to the people who respect your work when you equate Lenin with Stalinism as blithely as you did tonight. If it were actually that simple, the, co the horrific kinds of measures that even bourgeois historians describe as a counter-revolution under Stalin would not have been necessary if they were all the same to begin with. That being the case, then I think we need a full and a serious and a fair discussion of various different alternatives. Uh, but let me give just a quick rundown of the reasoning for those that have never even considered any other social system outside of what we know today. Very simply, the earth is a system and must be treated as such. There are resources all over the earth, and therefore we must have a system that can monitor these global resources within a global technological infrastructure. It's not just talking about the horrors of capitalism, but actually how to change it to end this stuff once and for all. So they can call this socialism if they want, but it doesn't do anything. It's just wasting, wasting air to call it socialism because it's radically different than every, every other kind of central planning or every other kind of, of institution that's existed historically, which is why I would never use that term because the historical stigma is so dramatic and links to central planning and all those other factors. I think, well, there's several questions there. One is about the discussion of the United States, and I think what I said is approximately what you said, except I didn't use some of that rhetoric. In a report coming out of the AFP, there is growing evidence that the current rate of our resource exploitation indeed has a time frame. The report states, quote, as it is, humanity each year uses resources equivalent to nearly one and a half Earths to meet its needs, said the Global Footprint Network, an international think tank. After the peasants were, were granted their land and started to become farmers, a tiny minority of them became extremely successful. Uh, John Jay had it straight. The people who own the country ought to govern it, uh, and the people who own the country have basically now are a network of uh, corporations and conglomerates and banks and so on. They ought to govern it, and the way they do it is by the methods we've described. We are demanding nature's services, using resources and creating CO2 emissions at a rate 44% faster than what nature can regenerate and reabsorb. This means that it takes the Earth just under 18 months to produce the ecological services humanity needs in one year. And those people produced almost all of the food for Russia and, and the Ukraine. So what happened in the 1920s when bloody Lenin came along and collectivized the farms was that they defined the kulaks, who were these tiny minority of successful farmers who maybe had a brick house and were able to hire a couple of people and had some land and some livestock and were very, very productive people. Lenin was a right-wing deviation of the socialist movement and he was so regarded. They defined them as socially unfriendly elements and they sent groups of intellectuals out into the towns to collectivize the farms. And he was regarded as that by the Marxists, by the mainstream Marxists. So the idea was that while well, you would pool your land and, and everyone would farm it collectively, and the land was taken away, of course, from the tiny minority of people who were actually productive and had actually managed to own much of the land. So you have to imagine how that would occur. And if humankind continues to use natural resources and produce waste at its current rates, we will require the resources of two planets to meet our needs by the early 2030s. We've forgotten who the mainstream Marxists were because they lost and you only remember the guys who won. But if you go back to the 
to that period, uh, the mainstream Marxists were people like, for example, Anton Panakuk. There isn't going to be any government at all. Okay, so it's in the 1920s. It's after the world, after World War I. Russia's in pretty bad shape. The villages are full of brutalized men who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, I didn't happen to talk about it tonight, but I've written about this topic. I haven't just made the charge. I've written about it and explained why I think it's true. And it doesn't bother me if I happen to agree with the mainstream media on this. Uh, Trotsky, to pick somebody uh, who you remember, uh, once he was charged in the 1930s uh, with agreeing with the fascists in his condemnation of the Soviet Union. And he pointed out that his critique was to be true. He didn't, wasn't going to abandon it if somebody else had to say, happened to say it for different reasons. So the question is about the Soviet Union, and particularly about Lenin. So what was Leninism? I think. Plus, as I'll point this out, one more thing is means of production has become equally as, as antiquated. It's, it's a cultural act. But, but, but these people don't know that. Yeah, they, they get the idea in the head it's social. Then thing. there's no easy answers. I, I don't, I, you can't just in one sentence uh, dismiss people that bring these things up, which is why I brought up these numerous issues. Like people say, well, the means of production, who owns the means of production? You say, it's, well, first of all, what do you mean by means of production? In the new world, the labor power is being replaced by machines. It's happening right now. That means capital goods is becoming labor power. Simultaneously, capital goods are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, which means they're becoming consumer goods, like 3D printing. You know, in theory, when you go to your home, your home computer and you print a piece of paper from your printer, you are engaging in many means of production. You are in control of that print process. That means you are in control of a very small means of production. So the lines are blurring dramatically from the scales, the economies of scale we had, both in Soviet communism and that we have now in the free market with these massive industrial processes. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which makes things on demand. So in other words, it becomes convoluted. So the very no notion of socialism by historical defense is convoluted and culture lagged compared to where we are today. Yeah. So. But the important thing, as far as this presentation is concerned, is how do the communists define it? And this is where many people are surprised to learn that the communists have an entirely different meaning for the word socialism than the average American has. Socialism is defined as most, because you get a lot of definitions, but most, in, the most, in the most average context, socialism is defined as the means of production owned by anything but private organizations. In fact, if you look at what Lenin wrote after that period, or did, you'll find it's a reversion to the earlier position. This sort of left deviation uh, is that, a deviation. You could ask why. In my view, it was just opportunistic. Uh, he knew that in order to gain power, he was going to have to go along with the popular currents that were developing, which were, in fact, spontaneous and libertarian and uh, socialist, as most popular movements are, have been, in fact, since the 17th century. And being an astute politician, which he was, he sort of went along with that and talked the line that the people wanted to hear. Did you know that there isn't a single communist country in existence anywhere on Earth? That's right, not one. Russia isn't a communist country. Red China isn't. Cuba certainly isn't. These are socialist lands. That's how communist leaders always describe them. Whatever your interpretation is, when he took power, he reverted to the former vanguardism uh, and moved at once to eliminate the organs of workers' control. Now, that meant he was moving to destroy socialism, if socialism has as its core workers' control over production. Uh, the Soviets and the factory councils were instruments of workers' control, but they were the instruments that had been developed in the course of popular struggle for, to implement, basically, workers' control, and those were the first things to go. By early 1918, this is now, it's still really before the Civil War set in, uh, Lenin's view was pretty clearly expressed. It was the view that, uh, uh, both he and Trotsky took the position that uh, what you need is what, what Trotsky called a labor army, which is submissive to the uh, control of a single leader. He said modern you know, progress and development and socialism requires that the mass of the population subordinate themselves to a single leader uh, in a disciplined workforce. Well, that has absolutely nothing to do with socialism. In fact, it's the exact opposite of it. He was criticized for that by people like Rosa Luxemburg and by... Uh, uh, Panacook and Gorter and the other mainstream sort of left Marxists. Who's that Pokemon? And, that, and I think they were right. Uh, it seems to me that 
uh, and, and then it just goes on from there. I mean, Lenin reconstructed the czarist systems of oppression often more efficiently, Cheka, KGB, and uh, other techniques of control and oppression. I think from that point on, there was nothing remotely like socialism in the Soviet Union. I think it was, in fact, uh, in my view, as a precursor of later forms of totalitarianism. Now, you know, you could, uh, th that's what I think happened, and I think that's what you discover if you look at the facts. Uh, now, why is it called socialism? And Peter, P some people will hear what we've talked about so far, and they'll say, listen, you're, you're criticizing the capitalist system. I, for one, work hard, pay taxes, believe in capitalism, and have no plan to move to Venezuela or Sweden. And, you know, some people are poor in capitalism, but if you're alluding to communism, everybody's poor in communism. And for those of you who need reminding, socialism doesn't work. How does someone like you, who has such a nuanced and detailed knowledge of these issues, start to break through those sort of knee-jerk reactions from some? Right now in America, there are forces dug in, organized, and well-funded to bring people together. Ah, socialism. Social socialism happened. Who, who, who would no doubt have that reaction when hearing what you've outlined so far. What's the best path into a productive conversation with someone who reacts that way? Socialists have or want what you have. I think the first step is to start to expose the mythology the Western world has has uh, ascribed to when it comes to historical communism. And lots of people who are not doing well at all, and the bloody intellectuals come into the town and they say, you know those successful farmers up the street that you've always been pretty jealous about in your useless manner? Well, they're actually pigs and demons who are stealing from you, so why don't you come out, we'll form a nice little mob and we'll take everything they've got. He seems to reduce Marxism when he actually talks about it to the problem of inequality, that some people are rich and others are poor. And he deals with that by the very sophisticated notion that poor people's anger at rich is their envy of the success. Mm. And that hatred, I think that hatred gets the upper hand in sociological movements. Inequality is indeed a social problem, but it has nothing particularly to do with Marxism. People have been talking about the problem of inequality for thousands of years before there ever was a Karl Marx or a Marxism. The whole point of Marxism was to explain why inequality under capitalism didn't go away. And they've had a debate. And we would have had that over the last 30 years if there weren't the taboo, the Cold War and all of that. And that's exactly what happened. And all those people were killed or raped or set off to Siberia in the middle of the bloody winter where there wasn't even anything for them to to anywhere for them to live or anything for them to eat. So they all died. And then the consequence of that was a few years later, six million people starved to death in the Ukraine. Historical communism as practiced in the Soviet Union uh, was a particular niche, a particular kind of central planning, a particular kind of authoritarianism. And so we're just getting back to kind of where we should have been. Let's have a debate. Strengths and weaknesses of capitalism, strengths and weaknesses of socialism. What and when people say this, they automatically create a false duality between capitalism and then this other supposed act, uh, ideal of what communism is or was or was supposed to be. And let's remind everybody, capitalism comes into the world in the French and American revolutions talking about being better than feudalism because under capitalism, you see, we are free, we are equal, we are democratic, and all the rest of it. Capitalism was to bring, in the words of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. We have capitalism, we sure do, but we don't have freedom, equality, and fraternity, not even close. They agreed for different reasons, uh, but uh, they basically agreed, and that then became doctrine and dogma. Well, I think people should ask whether that's true. And what it is or was or was supposed to be in terms of communism or socialism or Marxism, any of those terms that people want to throw out. Mm -hmm. You're a Marxist economist. Do you think, really, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? No, and inevitability has never been my strong suit. I it's, it's extremely counterproductive because there's very little critical analysis or historical understanding of what actually happened with those social systems or social approaches. I don't know what the future is going to bring any more than anybody else does. I think when you have people who are struggling 
and it's hard and they're trying to make a change and it doesn't come easily there's a temptation to believe that somehow it's in the works it'll happen for sure maybe not right now but in the future it's a it's an indulgence but it's not a serious idea i think the question of socialism is up for grabs as is the question of capitalism too every other system has been born changed and died give, capitalism too give it not to mention the grand ambiguity i mean to even talk about what socialism means today is to define it about you know 10 dozen different ways as i think you know why do you think the socialism is so good for america now why because capitalism isn't doing a real good job for most americans we have a level of inequality that is extreme going back i mean so i i step back from that and i try to take a train of thought perspective as opposed to a polarized one young <laughs> What's the matter with kids? Apparently there are a bunch of commies. <laughs> According to a new Harvard survey, 51% of 18 to 29 year olds said they don't support capitalism, while only 42% said they did. But an astounding 33% said they supported socialism. Just because something isn't market capitalism doesn't necessarily mean it's communism. So you start from that position. And then you start to outline what it is in society that's actually created the advancement. Again, the progress has been uneven. It was UK and the US that first made what Angus Deaton calls the great escape from universal wretchedness. Uh, in the 20th century, South Korea, which was once a dirt poor country, has become uh, filthy rich, uh, followed by Chile and China and India are now starting to show exponential growth. And I, I hate, I wouldn't say things like economic growth because that's a contrivance of market capitalism, but what has actually improved people's lives? What are the mechanisms that have led to higher standards of living, to reduced uh, child mortality, to, to, to the current alleviation of poverty that's been slowly, slowly getting a little bit better over the course of the past 60, 70 years? We've also had two collapses of this capitalism in the last 75 years, one in the 30s and now another one in 2008. Most Americans are not back to where they were in 2007 in terms of their real incomes. Their jobs are less secure. They have fewer benefits. I think you're seeing a return to socialism, not so much because people like socialism. That may come. I don't think it's there yet. It's people who don't like what they got and what they see and what they see for their kids. So there's also the 